Now let's compare the two systems of capitalism. In the competitive free enterprise system, capital or property is both owned privately and controlled privately. In the monopolistic system, holding title to capital can be accomplished privately or by the state. But more importantly, capital is controlled by the state or by the elite few who control the state. The Communist Manifesto, which contains the basic program for all communists and all socialists, explicitly preaches the destruction and abolition of private property. Karl Marx understood the powers of controlling capital and so have all communists and socialists who have ever looked and still look to Marx as their leader. State-controlled capitalism results in high prices and low quality. After all, why would a monopoly strive to improve if it has no competition? On the other hand, honest, thrifty and hard-working producers throughout the world prefer competitive free enterprise system for all. Here, low prices and high quality prevail because a variety of producers will seek to attract the widest amount of customers. Competition results in excellence and always has. Just as the political spectrum shows the range of government power, we can also plot the various economic systems along another spectrum. These forms of government control in the market stand in sharp contrast with a completely free market. In the last century or so, there have been basically four forms of state-controlled economies, all on the far left of the economic spectrum. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. In each, the government controls the capital. The difference among these is how much is owned or controlled outright by the government. In a fascist system, the government doesn't own businesses on paper, but it does control them. In Mussolini's Italy, even though he didn't hold title to businesses, he told the owners what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce, where to buy raw materials, who to hire, who to fire, and what price to charge. The rest, he said, was up to them. The fascist system is more efficient than other state control systems insofar as those living under it think they still own their businesses. Shopkeepers concern themselves with maintenance on the machinery, employee relations, painting the building, and so forth. But the government controls owners through an array of taxation and regulations. Under Nazism, which means National Socialism, its proponents went one step further and acquired ownership of some corporations, such as Volkswagen. However, Hitler didn't seize ownership of other industrial giants. He simply controlled them just as Mussolini had controlled businesses in Italy. Socialism is where government officials acquire possession of major industries such as transportation, communications, and utilities in order to leverage control over the entire economy. Through ownership of these vital segments of industry and by creating government regulatory agencies, socialists gain control over virtually everything else. Finally, there is communism, the granddaddy of all in the economic sense, in a way, communism is more honest than fascism because all of the capital is owned and controlled by the state. There are no pretenses about it. Now let's combine political and economic systems because ultimately one never exists without the other. We see again that there are only two ultimate choices. A competitive free enterprise system in a republic or a monopolistic state control system under an oligarchy. A moral people have always been a vital element of America's strength. The Founding Fathers well understood the biblical teaching that righteousness exalteth a nation. They also knew that expecting a free market economy and limited government under a republic to endure without morality was expecting the impossible. James Madison cautioned that limited government alone was inadequate for our nation. And John Adams observed, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington stated, 
reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Yet there are people today who think that liberty is license and that morality is unimportant or irrelevant to politics and economics. But as Benjamin Franklin added, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The alternative to Americanism is what has condemned most of the human race to live as slaves throughout the millennia. It is the idea that rights are privileges dispensed by an oligarchy according to the unlimited rule of men, that the state should control or own the nation's capital with all economic activity directed from a central power, and that morality is inconsequential, and that security is preferred over freedom and opportunity. Our nation continues to be steered off course, and the principles that led to America's greatness are being cast aside. The simple question for us is, do we continue to slide away from our nation's founding principles, or do we return to the kind of government we inherited? Time is running out for Americans who sense that something is wrong. They have to decide what kind of a country we shall leave for future generations. All that is needed is for a sufficient number of Americans to get involved in the fight for freedom and to return our nation to less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world.